fundamentals of the question of categories. Now, Mr. Um, Cabinet's argument, of course, is that the main legislative purpose is to enable the employer to make plans. We see that in paragraph 14 of the skeleton of the court's note. <coughs> but to highlight my Lord, um, Lord Justice Davis's point about ambiguity in purpose, he, he's not saying that's some abstract purpose. He's saying that it is a purpose which informs the construction of categories. And you see that captured rather neatly in the um, his submissions below, which are divided five of the core bundle. subsection 3a must be interpreted in the light of the legis legislative purpose. Now at the time that was version 2 and subsection 3a was the one that referred to categories. So the clear submission isn't that this is some purpose in the abstract. It is of course that it informs the interpretation of categories. And, and one sees that because he's effectively saying the employer's needs drive how type or specificity of categorization. Um, and it will be a question on his interpretation, as he rightly accepts, that is binary and will depend crucially on the employer's needs, which the union in effect has to second guess. Now, we say fundamentally those arguments can't survive the 2004 amendments. The purpose of removing the words, as would assist the employer in making plans, wasn't uh, because they were OTOs. It was because of the uncertainty such a requirement would cause unions and the practical difficulty it caused of compliance. Now, perhaps we can begin with the government uh, review document, which led to the changes, and which you haven't been taken to. First one, these were these were in the first flush of the well um, late flush of the late government. The first one is in divider 15 of the authorities bundle. This was a um, and it's at page 19 of the internal numbering on 15. Review of the Employment Relations Act, which had introduced the changes in 1999. Uh, Mr. Cabinet, you have no objection to us having a uh, sight of this document no. for this purpose? Okay. And one can see it. Um, industrial Action Notices, we've only got the extracts to them, are dealt with at page 20. And at 3.26, the government highlights there is evidence that the requirements on unions have become more arduous and more uncertain under the Act. Um, and refers to matrices, and then goes on specifically to refer to the case that Mr. Kavanagh relies upon, London Underground and RMT. Um, picking it up three lines down, the judgment stated that the 99 Act had not made it easier for, for a union to prepare notices and may have made it more arduous. Unions have also complained they're often required to supply detailed information in addition to the matrices to assist the employer to make plans. A phrase which is open to wide interpretation. In fact, unions do not know in advance what the notice requirements actually entail. So there's the context. And um, at 3.28, the law on notice is in complex and gives rise to costly legal actions. Well, today to some largely by that. They refer to the failure of the 99 Act to simplify the law and therefore proposes changes to ensure simplification. So the first aim is to simplify the minimum informational requirements, that's the first bullet, um, and just requiring unions to list the categories, 
and at the end they say redefining the purposes for which the information is provided by the re making, replacing the making of plans. And the other one was um, categorising more tightly what was meant by information in the possession of the union. So one sees two broad policy objectives. One, easing the burden on the entities. Two, simplifying Exhibit 3.22 at page 23. It refers to the consultation document which we've just seen where the gov government made proposals to simplify and clarify the law. At 3.23, it refers to the viewpoints of various unions and notes in the last paragraph that unions also noted that the current law, especially the requirement to, to supply such information as enabled the employer to make plans, produced a potentially open-ended requirement on them which created great uncertainty. So highlighting the specific problem of the plan's requirement, and then the government's actual proposal is at 3.26, which then fed, of course, into the bill and the Act. Um, it, re it rejects arguments that the notices should be repealed. Both notices serve useful purposes. However, the government considers that the existing law is so seriously deficient insofar as it places unrealistic and unclear obligations on unions. Um, the law should therefore be amended by clearly defining what information the unions need to provide. The government intends to remove the making plans wording and the obligation to provide matrices. So one sees there three elements, if I can put it like that. First of all, removing the uncertainty in the law about which unions complain. Secondly, reducing the burdens on the unions, and one sees that in all of the proposals. And thirdly, that the specific removal of the words about assisting the employer to make plans being central to that um, legis legislative scheme. Now, the reason, of course, I draw attention to this is because on Mr. Kavanagh's uh, argument, these changes are effectively of no effect. We're effectively back where we were with London Underground um, and interpreting categories in the light of how they help that helps the employer to plan. And with all the uncertainty for the unions that entails. That's even more explicit in the explanatory notes. And although we went to them briefly, can I just go back to the 2004 explanatory notes? That's at page 16 of the Bible, 15. There at 137, it refers to the, the review that we've just looked at, and again specifically identifies the problem highlighted by the very case that Mr. Kavanagh places at the forefront of his submissions, the London Underground one. The specific note that deals with the intention of the changes is at 143. And um, if I can just pick it up at about by four, four lines down, new subsection 2C, little Roman 2, provides that where some of all of the effective employees are employees from whose wages the employers makes deductions representing plates and to the, to the union, then the notices must contain either the lists, figures and, and explanations mentioned in 2C1. Now if one keeps a, figure, a finger in there and goes back to version 3 at page 7, One sees that 2C Little Roman 1, which that explanatory note is referring to, refers to the lists mentioned in 2A, and those are over the page in 2A. They are a list of the categories of the employee to which the employees belong. So this explanatory note is expressly addressing 
the lists meaning categories. And it goes on to say the intention is to reduce the uncertainty currently present in section 226A by making the information that the union must supply specific and critically and re removing the need for the union to determine what information has to be given by reference to what would help the employer to make plans and bring information to the attention of those to be balloted. Now, it's agreed between us these are admissible. We refer now skeleton to Lord Stay in the National Asylum case. But that is the clearest indication possible that the very purpose of the 2004 amendments in relation to categories, the lists, was to remove the need to the, to, for the union to determine what information had to be given to help the employers make plans. So there is the, there, there could not be a clearer indication that the term categories was no longer to be interpreted in that light. I think we'll find Count Holder, who said in the case, that the very worst person to ask what a statute means is the person who drafted it. <laughs> well, my Lord's point is... It's rather apt to confuse what he intended to do with what he has done. Well, my Lord's point is perfectly made by the 1999 changes, which were meant to simplify and clarify, and as we saw, created. But nevertheless, the, the, this removed the plans requirement, and one could see it was clearly intended, and in my submission it's not difficult to interpret the section in that light, to remove the need to determine that by reference to the employer's plans. Now, Mr. Kavanagh's repost is really at, the, at 58 to paragraph 58 and following of his skeleton. <coughs> and it's 61 that's the critical paragraph. Followed, it follows in terms is submitted that in the current version of section 226A version 3, the inherent legislative purpose remains what it has always been, primarily to require the union to provide useful information to the assist the employer in making contingency plans. With respect, that simply can't and he can't be matched with the fact that the removal of those words was deliberate and meant to achieve a result. But the underpinning, sorry to use this word again, rationale, surely has remained constant. The yes. very fact that you are required to give some details is to enable an employer to make preparations to plan. That is a constant. Yes. And what you're saying is, that's one thing. It's quite another uh, to build in references to plans into the statute provisions to define to yes. define the content of the information you give. Yes. That was version two. Yes. And you say that is quite different. Yes. Without what, depending on reason for having such a provision at all. Yes. What, what we're saying is that may, that may be the original purpose. It may still be a purpose. But it's been now been subsumed in relation to the construction by removing the reference of employers' plans. So in the interest of legal certainty and making these matters more operable, that purpose has been subsumed well, in another well, what, what I would say is, version 2 uh, provided for an entirely different content to the obligation. Yes. And that's been pulled back, as you would say. Yes. Yes. And it can't be said, well, the original inherent purpose revised for the purpose of construing categories. And the inherent purpose is always there. Well, the inherent purpose may be there. It doesn't tell you what the obligation is. It precisely. It doesn't affect the construction of categories. Still, there is that inherent purpose. We wouldn't have section two two six a at all. Yeah, but the plans are not an aid to construct. Tell you what you're in, the yeah. yeah. Now, the, and the parliament has left us with the word categories. categories. Yes, but at the same time, making clear that is not to be interpreted by reference to plans. So you're left with an ordinary word, which courts interpret in statutes all the time, which we have the guidance of Lord Justice, Justice Elias in Serco guidance of the other cases to say it's a general type of worker to echo Lord Justice Buxton in 
um, uh, Westminster, or it's the general category in Elias, uh, the Lord Justice Elias and Circa. I would you accept the word category has a certain degree of flexibility built within it? More than that, it's, it has a degree of, it's a protean concept with an impossible degree of flexibility in it almost. I'll because, take that as a yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Mr. Kavanagh's so argument. That's right. Would you then acknowledge that questions of fact and degree do come into the matter? Well, you would have to decide has the union categorised? Yes, I agree. But at the same time, far from saying when we approach that question, we do so in light of the employer's plans, one does so in light of a different test, which is to say Parliament intended these to be operable by unions, to reduce the burdens, and so provided they've adopted a sensible, rational, reasonable system of categorisation, it should not be second-guessed or overridden by the employer's needs. So to that extent, extent I, I agree with my Lord, it's a question of fact and degree, but it's one that isn't subject in the union to the, to the uh, imposition, if I can put it that way, of what the employer's needs are. It's starting from the opposite direction from the union's perspective and saying, have they chosen that categorisation, which is sensible and reasonable. And if you ask that in the present case, there's only one answer. You say there's only one answer. Well, not, not. Um, Mrs. Justice Elizabeth Lang also said we have met general categories because she applied circa when it came to the matter of exercising her judgment. She said, I've had regard to what Lord Justice Elias said in circo, and I, it, it's clear from the structure of her judgment she considered we've met that test. At the risk of boring the court to death, the effect of Mr. Kavanagh's interpretation is the change has had no effect. And that simply can't work because these weren't inadvertent, they were deliberate. And as to saying you couldn't draft something to this effect, um, Lady Justice um, Simlo has already given an example, I'm no parliamentary draftsman, but it wouldn't be difficult to say something like, for the purpose of this section, categories shall be described in such details would assist the employer in making plans or something to those to that end. So that that is an objection without um, I, I submit without without merit. And if you want to see an example of of a the problem that the it, of Mr. Kavanagh's fact and degree test, it's precisely this one, this case here. 35. He considers um, BA to be similar to Virgin. They both operate a similar complex fleet. fleet. He looks at the PPU case, as he explains. He looks at the code and he, he categorises pilots in accordance with how they're described in their contracts, in accordance with how they're described in, their, in the corporate directory. And um, still, we're told that's not sufficient. So we're back, if I may say so, with the dogs. And another employer will come, another airline, will no doubt turn up to Balfour and say, well, sorry, the details you gave specifying fleet isn't what we want. We want other details of categorisation because of our specific needs, which I can only begin to guess at. And as um, my Lord, Lord Justice Davis said, MPs is precisely an example of this. But earlier on in the litigation, they were saying, well, we need more details about management pilots to help us plan, which they've now dropped. But it becomes impossible for Balpa to predict what the, what the employer will need, what the employer will say. Sometimes it may, sometimes it may not. It, 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 its plans require. So against that background, can I, can I turn to the judgment? of um, Mr. Justice Elizabeth Lang. Um, in my submission, one can't read paragraph 78 without looking at the submission of Mr. Kavanagh, 
at 68 and following, where he was submitting on the basis of um, the London Underground case that subsection 3A and 5A on categories must be interpreted in the light of it. So it was his submission that that plan was, a, was an aid to construction. And sorry, so I'm so sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Ford. Which paragraph? It was paragraph 68. 68 of the judgment. Of the judgment, yes. yes. Thank you. So that was his, his, his submission was that you must construe categories by reference to the legislative purpose. And in um, paragraph 78, this is Justice Elizabeth Lamb, they're saying it, it's rejecting that submission. It is difficult to see how, given the Parliament has expressly removed the reference to planning from the statutory language, it can be right to submit that planning can be the primary or indeed a purpose of the current provisions. In other words, for the purpose of construing categories which is what the submission was. And if emphasis was needed, if that's what she's doing, you get it in the next sentence, where she said, I do not consider that I get much help from the decision of Robert Walker in, uh, Lord Justice Robert Walker in the prior two cases, <coughs> echoing the submission below <coughs> and rejecting it. And again, at paragraph 80. It seems highly significant that the purpose is no longer said to be to enable the employer to plan. So she has rejected the, sub, the, the submission and said no, in light of the deliberate legislative changes. Instead, we should, I should focus on what categories means. And also, again, I, it seems to be rather clear if one could focus on the content of the obligation hmm. and the purpose, as we now know, from all this debate can be can lead to ambiguity. Yes. It, it would have been better. better. I, I would, it would be better to say the content of the obligation yes. is no longer geared yes. to helping the employer to plan. Yes, or the planning is no longer an aid to the construction of the term. Well, that's where you... Another way, I, I, I accept but my but alternative. Uh, point no, no, this you do accept the underpinning rationale yes. is still there to explain yes. why the section exists at all. I mean, yes. you do accept that. Yes. All right. Um... So that's stage one in her judgment, 78 to 80. She's rejected the submission and said, no, you, you don't. Um, I, I've got how my Lord puts it. Um, and if, if we're right on that, that's an impeccable self-direction at 78 to 80. Bear in mind this is delivered late on Tuesday afternoon after a day of legal argument, and I'm told immediately after the submissions, of, uh, which now is a question of discretionary judgment for the judge, if, if, if there is one. She does that by applying what Lord Justice Elias said in the... Um, that's the clear general approach. So now she's applying the test, having taken the planning requirement out. That's a matter for her judgment on the... It's not said that's an unsustainable conclusion. British, Air, British Airways' only complaint is to say she misdirected herself on the first part. If we're right, she correctly directed herself on the first part. Her finding that we provided general job categories then becomes unassailable. Where, where does she say you well, provided general? She doesn't, she says, she refers to Lord Justice Elias. But wasn't and then, that in the context of her conclusions at 78 yeah. to 80? Well, that, it, that's saying I'm, I'm helped by yes. what he says yes. in Having my conclusion that the <coughs> purpose is no longer yes. a, a yardstick against which to judge categories. Well, it, it is, but, and she go, but it's also linked with what she said earlier, at paragraph 79, that I consider the best, this is a four lines down, I consider the best guide to the purpose of them is the language which has been used. She refers to whether he said, he said general job categories, she considers that the correct approach, and then it's really read my lady at the end of 84, where she concludes, therefore, it's more likely than not that the union will succeed.
and in a sense that must logically follow because all of Mr. Kavanagh's submissions are focused on purpose. If he loses on the, on the purpose point, he loses in my submission. Now, I, I realise I've gone slowly, but my, my, I, I'm now going to turn to the cases, but I hope I can deal with them briefly, because none of the cases have actually considered this point. None of them have actually addressed this, this argument, because even though some have looked at the legislative history, there is no case which has looked at it for the purpose of how one reads categories in the light of the deletion of the reference to plans. Well, there will be an authority now, isn't there? <laughs> well, there will be now, yes. But in a sense... Is that the Virgin? Yes, I, forgive me, it's the Virgin case. But it, even which in the Virgin... Come, which you are going to come on to. I will come in. But even in the Virgin case, what's critical there is the acceptance from Mr Kavanagh that Ms Justice Chowdhury wasn't taken to the legislative history. So he didn't address this argument. Well, no well, we'll, we'll, we'll come on to that. Yeah. Yeah. So if I write, we can all get, that's the end of British Airways case, because if, if we write on purpose, um, we win. And in my respectful and submission... And if you're wrong, isn't that the end of your case? Um, well, I, have, I do have an argument why we, we would still win on general categories, which I'll come to at the end. Right. But apart from that... Yep. Now I... I've already highlighted in many instances the problems of uncertainty in the category. Um, I just so we will be back where we were before the amendments. So in, against that background, I'll, I will turn briefly to the authorities. Um, first of all, London Underground and the RMT case, the divider A three. So this is the case that Mr. Kavanagh took, took you to, which was at the time of version 3, version 2 rather. The, really the critical passage is once you've, only, you've already been shown, so I'll deal with you quickly and just say something about them. First of all, paragraph 46 in Lord Justice Robert Walker. where he refers over the page of 661 to the changes in 99 and saying there was not any significant change in legislative policy or in the purpose for which information was to be given. Well, we say that all changed in 2004 because there then was a change in legislative policy. See the provisions we've just, um, we've already looked at. He goes on to say it wasn't intended to make it easier for unions to prepare notices. Uh, again, that changed in 2004 because the very objective was to make them easier. And then at 48, as we've already seen the passage that Mr. Kavanagh places particular reliance on, to that extent, subsection 3A, which is the one about categories, must, in my view, be interpreted in light of the legislative purpose which um, has always been inherent in there and which now has been spelled out in the amendments. This, of course, is the very case that was referred to as generating problems in the review. I'll give you the reference. It's paragraph 3.227 and referred to again in the explanatory notes as one of the reasons for the change. That's paragraph 137 of the explanatory notes. Yet, according to Mr. Kavanagh, an inherent purpose now magically revives to fill the void and to create precisely the same effect. So we say this, this case was, of course, authority at the time on the, how you interpret categories, but it can't survive the amendment. The next case, which again I'll try and deal with briefly, is Westminster and Unison. Uh, 
the one about people described as AA workers. Now this too is a version 2 case. Tab. Oh, sorry, tab 4. And I, so this was at a time when there was an express requirement to, to refer to the employer, to assist the employer in making plans. But nevertheless, it's interesting to see the indications both Lord Justice Peel and Lord Justice Buxton gave as to working out categories. First of all, Lord Justice Peel at 56. He says it's not suggested that different professions or trades are involved in the assessment of the advice unit. So he seems to have treated categories, even on the basis of the old law, as being somehow a synonym for professional trades, emphasising again the width, of the width of the words, and regardless of the express purpose. And then exactly the same in the judgment of Lord Justice Buxton where he said at paragraph 78 towards the bottom which you've already been taken to so I'll do it quickly in my judgment it is a very broad word and not to be either exclusively or narrowly defined it means no more than a reference to the general type of workers so that was the clearest indication we had prior to 2004, of an attempted definition of category. There was no attempt in the London Underground case. And on any view, whether you adopt Lord Justice Pill's trade or profession, or Lord Justice Buxton's general type of worker, we met that here, even on the basis of the old law. Two thousand code of practice. So these are code of practices which um, are meant to give practical guidance to you. This is at divider fifteen, page twenty-five. So this was the code at the time of the two thousand and four amendments. Uh, prior to them, I should say, and one sees at paragraph 14 at page 28. There's an express reference at 14 of the third bullet to the union needing to provide information by reference to the employer's plans, giving various examples of that. And highlighting that that's a matter for the employers, um, uh, based on the employers' needs. And at 18, they refer to, um, the code refers to the requirement is likely to be satisfied by indicating the employer that entitlement to vote will be given to all the union members engaged on, for example, a specified kind of work activity or in a certain grade or at a particular location. In some cases, if the employer would otherwise be left in doubt, more specific information, such as a combination of these items and information, may be needed. Um, I skipped a bit about names. Ultimately, it will also be a question on the facts for a particular case, where the no whether the notice gives an employer the required details. So there you have the employer-focused needs, which is Mr. Kavanagh is saying that's still the test despite the 2004 amendments. But then after the 2004 changes, the code was changed. If you look at um, page 30, this is the code introduced after the um, 
amendments to the 2004 Act have been made, and the, 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 any reference to plans has gone. Why? Because Parliament had deleted it, and the relevant paragraph is 15. now says there are many ways to categorise a group of employees. When deciding which categories it should list in the notice, the union should consider choosing a categorisation which relates to the nature of the employee's work. For example, it might be based on occupation, grade or pay bound of the employees. The decision might also be informed by the categorisation of the employees typically used by the employer in dealing with the unions. The availability of data to the unions is also a legitimate factor in determining the union's choice. We now see a different approach. Now the focus is not on the employer's needs. The focus is very much on the union having a, an element of discretion, if you like, in how it categorises employees. And that, that is the, precisely the same wording now found in the 2017 code, which was introduced after the Trading Act 2016 without um, the amendments. So once again, the codes also indicate that Mr. Cavanagh's point is incorrect. It should no longer be a question of fact and degree based on the employer's needs, but rather it should be recognised that, that in light of the objective of the 2004 changes, unions are given a degree of latitude, if I can put it that way, in how they categorise um, uh, employees. They're not expected to second guess the employer. So, my Lord, um, um, when one's talking about certainty here, in my respectful submission, it's certainty from the perspective of the unions. That was the objective of the 2004 changes not to introduce a legal regime which became opaque for unions to operate. Certainty from the provision, from the perspective of the person subject to the obligation, the union. And with the utmost respect to Mr. Kavanagh, his, his whole submission will return us to what he himself described, I think, as a dog's breakfast based upon 1999. The dog will be back with a similarly unpalatable breakfast. There is only one case, appellate case, uh, post-2004, and that's Serco. That's in Divider 8. say again there was no argument there before Mr. Uh, before Lord Justice Elias and the other members of the court, Lord Justice Heatherton and Lord Justice Mummery, about the effect of these changes. The only argument about, the only reference to legislative history was for the purpose of examining what um, was meant by information in the possession of the union. Mr. Kavanagh draws attention, of course, to paragraph 63, where, it refer, where Lord Justice Elias referred to the current rationale. Well, we, we have no quarrel with the current rationale. To make the, this is paragraph 63, my lord. But the point is, that cannot possibly help us in deciding what the effect in 2004 of the removal of the reference to helping the employer to make plans achieve. We would also rely on paragraph 71 which support the point I've, I've already made, 
where he did refer to the 2004 Act and say they were intended to part to deal with the difficulties raised in the London Underground case. And it would be surprising if they were intended to make them the duties on you more onerous, which is the case that Mr. Kavanagh still places at the forefront of these submissions. The last page of the judgment. There is no statutory obligation requiring the union to use any particular category of jobs. That supports our point that there is a degree of discretion here given to unions. They are not required to use any particular categorization. Of course, that's if, if Mr. Kavanagh is right, that's wrong. Because he says it's a binary question where there will, effect, in effect, be an obligation requiring the union to use the system of categorization that best suits the employer's needs. And goes on to say, indeed, there is clear authority the only obligation is to provide numbers by reference to general job categories. So if Mr. Kavanagh is right that Lord Justice Elias was proceeding on the assumption that the purpose continued to dominate, when it came to how he treated job categories, he gave no reference to that purpose. He simply said, it's general job categories. There's a, um, he implies there's, there's a degree of discretion on the union, as we said, um, and therefore the Union here met it. So nothing in this case can conceivably be read as suggesting that the meaning of categories is somehow cut down by what Lord Justice Elias, or somehow informed by what Lord Justice Elias said was the rationale. It's quite interesting uh, the way Lord Justice Elias says whatever difficulties that might cause an employer in marginal cases. Yes. So uh, that you might say that reference is this is not given a prior everything he would like to know. Yes. Because the uh, Lord of Elias is possibly contemplating there'll be cases yes. where the prize will not get yes. that which they would have wished to have got. Yes. Partly because he's already recognised there's a union's got no clear way of knowing how you categorise. I mean, it strikes me as somewhat absurd to use British Airways analogy and say, well, your department is fleet and therefore your category is fleet. I mean, I've I've not heard people say, well, my category of employee is based upon the department to which I'm assigned. Um, it strikes me as a, a, a poor analogy, but it does, I, it does make clear that the Lord Justice Elias, who knows more about this area of law than any other living human being, I think, says that this is, this is a matter with some discretion for the union, whereas as marginal cases, um, and he's focusing very much on the union's perspective rather than the employer's. And that, of course, is exactly the passage that Mrs. Justice Elizabeth Lang relied upon to the extent it was a question of fact and degree based upon the union's choice. She has come down on our side. So, um, to deal with the point um, raised by Lord Justice Hamlin about the um, PPU case. I'll come to that now. That's a divide of 13. <coughs> but my lords and my ladies note, this is dealt with by Mr. Justice Elizabeth Lang today. Um, one begins at 30, paragraph 36, where he refers to the London Underground Limited and again, um, do away with. deals with the Westminster case at paragraph. Critical part of the judgment is really the 
submissions which he accepts at paragraph 48. These are the these are the four submissions made, I think, by Mr. Kavanagh, but one sees at 52 over the page that Mr. Justice Chowdhury agreed that they fairly summarise the relevant principles. So he adopts them. So the first one is that the purpose is to enable, this is paragraph 48, to enable the employer to make plans to avoid or mitigate industrial action. The information as a category must be useful in reliance is placed upon London Underground and RMT. We, secondly, at 49, whether a union has satisfied the obligation is a question of fact and degree by reference to all the circumstances. And fourthly, echoing what Mr. Um, Kavanagh says today, this is an absolute obligation. doesn't mean if the employer work it out. What do you say about um, the first sentence of paragraph 49 of Mr Justice Chowdhury? Well, to some extent, as, as we've established, it may be a question of degree, but it's not a question of degree driven by the first requirement of 48, because that is to ignore the 2004 amendments. Uh, I understand that point, but uh, do you quarrel in general terms with the statement? It is a question of fact and degree well, I, to all the circumstances. I do, because if that's meant it's purely an objective to satisfy the requirements of the statute, ultimately yes. is an objective appraisal. Yes, of course I accept that. But, but, but nevertheless, as Lord Justice Elias said in Serco, there's no single way of categorising them and the, and the union is deployed, obliged to adopt any single method. I'm not sure if I'm correctly using the language of discretion at this point, but it's a question viewed from the perspective of whether the union has adopted a rational categorisation, not from whether the employer's needs require another one. And the difficulty with the proposition of paragraph 48, namely the bold assertion, the information as to the category must be useful. Well, we've established there is an underlying purpose in this, but what that's it doesn't say, well, how useful is it meant to be? Yes. It just doesn't help you at all. No. Or we'd be left with every employer turning up and saying, exactly. I need more. Which goes back to 99. I mean, perfectly legitimately, uh, a trade union would like to be uh, of as least use as it can get away with, yeah. bluntly. And conversely, an employer would like to try and drive unions into giving more and more detail to an almost ad in fact. Yes. Uh, yes. These, are, these aren't good faith obligations. Exactly. These are, exactly. This is you have to do that. So it really comes back to what the statute says has to be done as a minimum. I mean, if one wanted to look at bad faith, one would say, well, pretty remarkable that British Airways never gave us any indication before they got our bad faith. We're not going bad for now, come on. Not going bad for now, <laughs> I should make jury points. Um, so you say it has to be rational categorisation. From the union's perspective, yes. So that if one says this is really outside. If, if, if you did take a case like the London Underground case, where the union simply said everyone who works there, you say, well, you haven't categorised them at all. It's, now, whether people. What about the Virgin case? Well, whether that crosses that line, I, I really don't want to say. Maybe. It's certainly, I have to accept that, Miss, that Mr. Justice Elizabeth Lang said that may have been a case where the categorisation was so open ended. That this but are you submitting that the Virgin case was wrongly decided? Yes. I'm su well, I'm submitting that it's wrongly, it's a, it's wrongly a, the law is wrongly approached. Are you submitting that it was wrong on the facts? I think I probably would say yes, but which doesn't arise in this case because in any event we did what Virgin required. So are you saying that had the, the ballot notice here simply said pilots, are you saying that's enough? Uh, you, need, I, you need to answer this. Yeah, I, I can see I might be in trouble there because the employer would say, well, really, you're not categorising them at all. You're just giving a, a lump. But pilots could be said to be a general category. Yes, but when, when one looks at things as how they're described in their contracts, for example, it refers to that. When one looks at what they give us on our database, it says captain. When one looks at the corporate director, one can see many considerations as to why you might say, well, look, these people describe themselves. You'll, you'll see that now in evidence. They describe themselves as captain, yeah. first officer, or whatever. So I'm not suggesting there isn't a point reached where the categorisation becomes 
in effect turns out not to be really categorized at all. But I don't know enough about Virgin. I don't know enough about the case to, to make some uh, decisions. Sorry, some, just a second ago, what's your, uh, had the, uh, the, the ballot notice sent to British Airways that simply said pilots with the appropriate numbers and all that, would that have sufficed or not in your submission? Um, in my submission, yes, but I don't need to go that far. And I would pray, Nate, there the code of practice which talks about occupation. <clears throat> now, the, the key one can see at 56, Mr. Justice Chowdhury was referred by Mr. Siegel, who was counsel to the union, of some changes in 2004, but it's accepted he wasn't taken to these particular changes. Um, and then the critical error I submit is for 57, and I don't mean any criticism of Mr. Justice Chowdhury because he wasn't taken to it. The history was, it's correct, the provisions were differently worded at the time of London Underground case. It seems to me that the legislative purpose behind these provisions has remained consistent throughout the different iterations. Of the so he was aware, given his background in inspection, to be aware of the various different iterations of the provisions. Well, he wasn't taken to this particular. He wasn't. This argument wasn't raised with him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The argument wasn't raised, but yeah. what Mr. Justice Chowdhury knew was that there had been differing versions of Section Two Two Six A. Yes. That. But. It, it, well, insofar as it wasn't, insofar as he ought to be aware, with respect, I would say he's still, he's, if he means the legislative purpose, the purpose of construction, to go back to the point, has remained the same, then we would say he's wrong. Because for the purpose of construing categories, it has changed. If that's what he's meant, he's wrong. And if, his, and if his approach to the question of fact and degree on Mr. Cavanagh's binary uh, questions is accepted, we will be back with all the uncertainty that I've already highlighted. And, and this is the perfect illustration because we, Balcon, look at this case, so this is the categorization which it says is required. We consider British Airways is. It's a similar position to Virgin, we followed it. Um, and now, so if it's binding on the point we gave, we complied with it, but for my submission it's wrong on, wrong on the law because it hasn't addressed the important change of policy and the express removal of the words. Um, If you look at paragraph 61 of Mr. Justice Chowdhury's judgment. Yes. And you wouldn't dissent from the first sentence. No. It's the, it's do, the, do dissent from the second sentence. No, because you can, you can have a general description that becomes so, so hopelessly vague one, one might say this isn't really giving any, this isn't really categorisation. Now, obviously, you then object to the purpose reference. But, well, like the next one. Well, course, would you dissent from what he says in 63? Yes, because um, that has to be viewed again from the perspective of the union, because there is no bright line between what are fundamental differences. You will be back with a question where the employer says. There are these differences between these roles. Take my example of the nurses in the NHS. It will make strikes, let, let's step beyond the airlines, it will make strikes in the public sector, sector for large unions almost impossible to organise. Because how is one to decide, if you go back to my nurse example, what on earth are the fundamental differences between the work done by by employees. Well, isn't technicians a good example? I mean, it's well, so broad as to really tell them 
by a nothing. Yes, that, that may you could say technician is a category in one sense, but in another sense, it's not. And that may be a that that be where one you say, look, as a union, you really have gone too far. Yeah. But this is not. This is not. That's not. That's not the case. Because we have complied with the contract descriptions. We've complied. With the, I'm repeating myself. So, so you you don't accept that it applies in this case, but you do accept that where there are fundamental differences between different employees, that may require more than a general job category and into a more specific job category. It might do. I'm loath to make any submissions based upon you know, questions of what are fundamental, but what can't drive what are fundamental is the employer's purpose. Yeah. Because then you're back with my NHS nurse problem. <laughs> But again, that's just a chapter in 6.3. He's put it quite cautiously because he said the obligation can, in my judgment, he, he, he's leaving it yes. open for the particular case. Yes, yeah. and in the, in the present case of 64, he talks about the very fundamental different roles from first officers and captains, which um, are referred to by um, Mrs. Justice Elizabeth Lang when she, in, in this case. And it seems as if he was aware at 79 that one ought to be careful in going too far. So he says, in coming to this view, I have seen the requirements, but in stating on the facts of this case, the requirement to provide categories effectively, employees requires at the very least the cap category of cap to be separately identified. I do not believe I have induced, introduced any onerous or unjustified obligation. So there's a, no, he, even he seems to have had a note of caution that I must be careful not, not to go further. So if he's right that there are these fundamental differences, we complied with it, um, that, that, that otherwise pilots would be so vague we haven't um, really categorised at all. Um, it's quite clear he, he, his whole judgment is sown throughout by the legislative pro purpose. And you see that again in 79. Simply referring to pilots does not, in my judgment, fulfil the, the legislative purpose. So it's all driven by the, um, the requirement that to help the, the employer to make plans, which we say with respect is gone. Uh, my Lord to my Lady, I'm conscious of the time. Uh, I don't know what you would like me to do about the other uh, cases. Perhaps I can uh, deal with them very shortly because they're, they're, none of them are at, a, at, at this level. They're just first instance decisions. Um, and so I'll try and deal with them very shortly. First of all, EDF and National U and RMT are five. That's the technicians. Yes. The generalised technicians. Just to, in, in so far as my lords and my lady are thinking, well, where do you begin to define the boundary? They just said, Catholic, our engineer, technician, that's at eight. In so far as Mr. Justice Blake was thinking, well, where's the outer edges? It's a paragraph 15. Where he refers to Lord Justice Hill in um, the Unison case, who one sees from the quote at the end of 58 said, it is not suggested that different professions of trades are involved. And um, Mr. Justice Blake said, I give emphasis to the words in that sentence. In other words, he took the view that this was a case where the actual professions of trades were different. Now, he didn't consider the argument that, raised, that we've raised here, but if you were to apply the different <coughs> professional trades uh, test here, we've met it. You can't say that the fleet <coughs> that you assigned somehow magically changes your professional trade, which fits again with more Justice Elias and Serco and saying this is a general type of worker. Maybe in this case, 
they weren't really giving the general type at all. It was given simply to Y. A metro line, which is a divide of 10. This is really where the descriptor, this is a checkoff case, of course, so the question became could the employer readily deduce um, the relevant information from what the union told it? And the union said, well, this is people working on the TFL contracts either on a full or part time basis. The real problem was, one sees it highlighted at 20, paragraph 25, that the descriptor was so vague, the employer couldn't actually identify who fell within it. Because looking at paragraph 25, this is um, one of the objections made in the correspondence. Um, there are some people who spend no time at all. This is at the top of the column, of the opposite column reading from the first indent with a dash. There are some who spend no time at all working on these contracts. There are some who work very occasionally on them. There are some who undertake work which is related to them. So effectively, it became their, their argument was, well, in those circumstances, we can't really deduce, and that's, that's a deductive question in the checkoff arrangements, we can't actually deduce who this is, who these are. We can't deduce the numbers. That's at 56 in Mr. Justice Substance. How, how could they deduce the total number of employees when there's a descriptor which is too vague for them to be able to come up with a number? That's not the case here. We've given the categories. We've given the numbers. So. I, and he didn't discuss. He didn't. He, he didn't discuss the matter any further than that. So, by submission, none of the cases have considered this argument on categories. If we win, that's it. But even without our argument, no case has required the degree of specificity, so far as I can tell, that British Airways is uh, seeking here. Even though. All the cases have assumed the purpose is to assist the employer. They've all assumed that's the purpose, but none have required this degree of specificity. And just to remind my lords and my lady, in, in the Westminster case, it was said to be the general type of worker, Lord Justice Buxton, or trade or profession, Lord Justice Pill. Circo, it was said to be general categories. Thirdly, PPU, it was said to be ranks. EDF, different professions or trades. None have gone so far, even assuming the purpose is to assist the employer, as British Airways wants Balfour to go here. My Lords, I'll deal briefly with the remaining points raised by... Um, British Airways, it really dealt with at paragraph 36 and following our skeleton. And um, we're, we're dealing with these specific points dealt with by British Airways. First one at 36, Roman 1 is um, Mr. Cavan says the judge's analysis has the result there is no statutory purpose at all. No, it doesn't. We accept there's an underlying purpose for giving information to the employers, but it's been overwritten by the changes in 2004. So, what the court should do now is simply ask whether. We have provided numbers by reference to general job categories, which is precisely what Mr. Justice Lang did. The second point raised by Mr. Kavanagh is at 71 of his skeleton, where 
he says the main purpose of the relevant requirements is to enable the employer to make contingency plans. Well, I've made the point ad tedium, regardless of whether that was the purpose or rationale, it isn't an aid to construction or, my Lord Justice Davies puts it differently. Thirdly, it says, alternative approach, Mr. Kavanagh's question of fact and degree based upon the needs of the employer is the one that really generates the uncertainty which the 2000... I, I think you agree that uh, to some extent there is a question of fact and degree, yeah. so long as it's not based on the needs of the employer. But I think you do accept... Yes, I do. So, I don't think I... I don't think you can argue for a totally bright line rule. No. No. The, the, and Parliament presumably meant that by leaving category undefined. Yeah, and leaving it to be judged from the perspective of the union. It's, it's a hopeless to say, well, how, how on earth would you categorise... Employees. I mean, are you three judges? <laughs> How there are so many ways, as I've emphasised many, many times, that, that you can categorise because employees are, are ranked in a hierarchy, but they're also distributed across um, different departments within a rank or hierarchy, and they have many other ways. Finally, it said that this is consistent with the, this is paragraph 74 and following, this is consistent with the Virgin judgment and with all the other cases. Um, well, none of the other cases have um, considered this argument. But insofar as they are relevant, the authorities have endorsed the test of general job categories, which we say we met. So, my Lord, that brings to the two additional reasons we say Mrs Justice Lang's decision should be upheld. Um, Mr Cabinet, you're not um, asking for formal respondent's notice, are you, in this case? Uh, no, I don't, I don't, I don't to hear what my learned friend says. Exactly I, I don't think that. time permitted probably the logic response. No. You're, you're, not, you're not taking procedural. I'm not taking procedural. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm extremely grateful. Um, and I've already pointed out... Um, going through all the cases where they did assume that categorisation was driven by the employer's plans. None had gone, including Westminster, um, including Circo, which on Mr Cavan's argument made this assumption. None has gone as far as BA now wishes Balfour to go. And to the extent the question is general categories, in Circo, which we say it is, that's ratio, it's, um, it's, it's this level of court. Um, we met it, and Mrs Justice Lang, more to the point, clearly found we met it because she cited Circo at 81, and in her conclusion, obviously, when the two are read <coughs> together, considered we have met it. So even if we're wrong on purpose, we still say we provided the general job categories that the section requires. And the, and the final point is that Regardless of exactly how Mrs. Justice Elizabeth Lang got there, she, the fundamental point was she was right to reject British Airways' argument on purpose. If this court accepts we are right on the question of purpose, there can be only one conclusion. Because there is no challenge to her finding or effective finding that we fell within the general category of worker. And we've given various evidential um, matters that show why that was clearly a finding which was open to her uh, on the evidence before her. Um, but in any event, it's not a matter challenged by British Airways on this appeal. Uh, my Lord to my Lady, unless I can assist you further. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
I lost my leg. May I begin by handing out the extract from Harvey oh, that, that was asked Thank you. Thank you. before the short adjournment. Whilst this is being handed up, may I respectfully make a caveat, and I say this as myself, a former editor of Harvey, uh, and I'm sure my lady will have her own view about this, but the, although it's an extremely useful resource for employment lawyers, uh, it's not always, if I may respectfully say so, entirely safe to rely upon it as an ex-cathedra statement uh, of the relevant principles of law in the way that Chitty perhaps might be regarded uh, or one of the more traditional textbooks. It's a loose leaf that yes. is updated okay. by a range of different people, yeah. uh, sometimes very regularly, sometimes not regularly at all. Uh, I say that... It's not a book you read as a whole. It's not a book you read as a whole. <laughs> no, I understand that. Uh, um, but... but None of the other employment um, uh, textbooks uh, really deal with this point in any helpful way. No. Friedman or others, I think. No, not that they've been able to find. No, Friedman is much more on the uh, contract. Uh, contract. And, and anyway, probably they haven't even caught up with the, uh, the Virgin Airways development in any event. Quite so. Despite that, and perhaps surprisingly, in light of my caveat, for what it's worth, passages in this are helpful to us. Uh, but what right. I say about Harvey nonetheless uh, stands. Uh, may I just show you what I've been able to find in a couple of minutes? On page five at the bottom, page five, yeah. uh, the bottom paragraph, the starting point for identifying a category of employee for this purpose is that it means a general type of worker and not, for example, particular job descriptions uh, or the categories used by the employer for pay purposes. It's obviously a reference to circo. But the degree of specificity required depends very much upon the circumstances. The policy underlying the enactment is that the employer is entitled to fair warning of where and when the industrial action is likely to hit him. So only some categories of hourly paid workers would be called on strike, then a category of hourly paid workers would be insufficient and it would be necessary to be more specific. Uh, and then on the next page, page six, having set out extracts from the cases, the bottom it says that the code confirms that everything depends upon the circumstances of the particular case. So, so far... I think, I think to an extent, uh, uh, you and Mr Ford agree on that. Yes. Uh, yes, so I, I, I'm not relying upon this as conclusive yeah. uh, support uh, for any of my uh, arguments. And indeed, if I may say so, the whole section, uh, understandably, it, the text is more of a precy of the authorities no, rather than no, no. a considered review uh, of the propositions to be drawn for it, from it. Uh, and there is a reference to the Virgin Atlantic case at page 8. Uh, an observation is made at the very bottom that whilst it's clear that what amounts to a category must indeed be affected by the circumstances of the case, it's more debatable whether one of these circumstances uh, should be the degree to which some workers uh, are more particularly difficult to cover or replace if they're on strike. This would seem to require the union to make an assessment of the employer's business and the relative importance and suitability uh, of the skills and qualifications of the employees who are to be balloted. Open questions remain as to whether such a requirement is warranted by the wording of the legislation, and if it is, whether this would be a justifiable interference with union rights under Article 11 of the Convention on Human Rights. Uh, as for that, as, as, as the Court may well be aware, there has already been an Article 11 challenge to the provisions in Tolka, which was uh, dismissed by this court. It's referred to in Circa, I think, at paragraph 8. Um, so, frankly, uh, the reference to the possibility of an Article 11 challenge I would take issue with. Uh, but in any event, in my respectful submission, Harvey does perhaps uh, provide a great deal of illumination for the particular issue uh, that this court is charged with deciding. Uh, my lords and my lady mayor, say that in light of my learned friend's submissions, it's clear that the parties are agreed on two key matters. The first is we're agreed on the reasoning of the judge below. We are agreed that the judge's decision was based on her self-direction that consideration of the content of the obligation relating to categories should take place on the basis that there is no legislative purpose to assist employers. 
My learned friends don't seek to equivocate as regards this being the reasoning of the judge, and indeed they wholeheartedly embrace it in their submissions today. <coughs> the second point upon which we are agreed is that nobody has ever previously advanced the interpretation argument that succeeded below, and that my learned friends are advancing in this litigation. Nobody has previously suggested in any of the cases, and they're all reported, or anywhere else, as so far as any of us can find, uh, that the legislative purpose that used to exist, we all agree, no longer exists. Uh, it's not been argued, it wasn't argued in the London Underground case, even though it could have been in those days because the legislative purpose wasn't stated. But more to the point, it's not been argued, let alone uh, adopted, in the cases that have been added during version 3. The RMT and Serco case, EDF, Metroline and Virgin Atlantic. And that's despite the fact that at least in the first instance cases, EDF, Metroline and Virgin Atlantic, it would have been a killer point. It would have been the case for the claimants. And I, I just mentioned, uh, I hope not unfairly, that my learned friend Mr Ford is junior counsel uh, in Metroline. But if this is such a great point, it's surprising in our respectful submission that it's not previously been adopted. It doesn't, of course, mean it can't be right. I fully recognise that. Uh, but it is a novel argument, a completely novel argument, and in my respectful submission the court should examine it with care for that reason. It doesn't reflect legal orthodoxy. Uh, and as my learned friend said in the earlier on about Mr. Lord Justice Elias, and the same could be said about Lord Justice Mummery, that they are extremely experienced in employment law. They were two of the court in the Serco case. Uh, and if this uh, extremely significant change had happened, between version 2 and version 3, one would have expected them to note it uh, in a judgment which carefully examined the legislative history. What do you say about the explanatory notes then? Uh, the explanatory notes are perfectly uh, reconcilable with our uh, position, if, if I may respectfully say so. Can I show the court that uh, explanatory note, the current explanatory note, uh, now, which is at... Uh, it's page 16 of the 15th part of the authorities' bundle. Paragraph 137, it highlights or it mentions that the national... The London Underground case highlighted the difficulty the way in which the information was required to be given in ballot and industrial uh, action notices and how they should be presented. Yes, that's absolutely right, but the difficulty concerned how far a union could be treated as possessing that information. It, this is not a critique of the analysis of the legislative purpose that one finds set out in the RMT case. And then over the page, at Power 141, I made this submission this morning, uh, we completely agree, indeed it's our case, that the change simplifies the requirements of Section 226A by making changes to the information the unions require to supply. And, in the interest of clarity, the section had to be restructured. And then taking a passage that my learned friend particularly relied on, halfway down 143, the intention is to reduce the uncertainty currently present in section 226A by making the information that the union must supply specific and by removing the need for the union to determine what information has to be given by reference what would help the employer to make plans and bring information to the attention of those to be balloted. The problem that that is referring to is that they, those weasel words at least that could be found in version 2. The problem with version 2 is that you could give categories and lists and still be in breach because version 2 required a union to think abstractly about what would benefit the employer and go even further than categories and lists if the case demanded it. But isn't that, isn't that uh, the, the removal of at least is uh, governed by the union must supply specific information. 
right? together. And then removing the need for the union to determine what information has to be given by reference to what would help. That's the planning purpose. That's the deletion of the words in the other part. My lady, my submission, they go hand in hand because the planning purpose is what forces the union in those days to decide what at least they had to do. In other words, what else they might have to do. So what this sentence is saying is that the whole structure has to be changed so that you're no longer saying to a union, you've got to try and work out not just categories in this, but all these other uh, possible pieces of information that you might need uh, to give an employer. Uh, because the need to determine what information has to be given by reference to what would help the employer was the need to determine that so as to decide whether you had satisfied the obligation by giving categories and lists and workplaces. Now we know that is enough uh, in version 3. In version 2, uh, you didn't. A union might have given everything there was to give about categories, everything there was to give about workplaces, and still on the statutory language be in breach because it had uh, misunderstood what the employer needed to do its planning. But the structural alteration of the latest version of section 226A would seem to go further than that because it is totally disconnected the need to help the employer to make plans and so on from the obligation itself. It's what? disconnected it. My Lord, with great respect, it hasn't disconnected. It's no longer Unless you come back to under, underlying. Well, but, it, but in terms of statutory language, there has been a disconnect. Completely. And the reason there's been a disconnect is because it's, it's not necessary. They've chosen to go down a different route of giving specific obligations, still with the same purpose in mind, instead of this amorphous, open-ended obligation that existed in version 2, which was impossible to delineate, however hard a union tried, because it didn't stop at, ca at categories and workplaces and lists. So my learned friend's submission um, <coughs> is determined, it, it, is predicated on the proposition that you threw the baby out of the bathwater after between version 2 and version 3. Not only did you uh, take away the possibility that a union could give lists and categories and workplaces and still be in breach, uh, but also you went further and took away the legislative purpose, <coughs> and yet there is nothing uh, in the either in the subsequent case law or in the rationale for the variation that uh, explains that or, or necessitates that. Well, one, one reading of those words, removing the need for the union to determine what information has to be given, is exactly what Mr Ford submits is the proper construction of the legislation in version 3. The Parliament has removed the need for the union to second guess what might help the employer uh, in terms of the categorisation and, and, and has uh, left it for the union to determine what categories to provide, with the starting point being general job descriptions. My learned friend is then hoist on his own petard, if I may respectfully say so, because if that's right, then why is pilots not enough? Well, well, he, he said it was. I think he would like, I think he was uh, well, he aware was, of that. Uh, <laughs> skewered slightly, if I may respect <laughs> sorry, it's unfair to put it that way, but, but he was conscious of the awkwardness that that created. But if he's right, then the, a union satisfies this obligation by saying any category that comes into its head. In which case, what's the point of the obligation? It doesn't get anybody anywhere. But, but as against that, um, your argument begs the question, how far do you go? How far must you help the employer? And your argument doesn't really help on that. But my learned friend's argument faces the same no, problem. No, 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 let's deal with your argument first. Yeah, well, in order to illustrate why that's caught so how all far day... do you go on your approach? How is one to know how far one has to go to help? It's a question of fact and degree. And up and down the country, all day, every day, courts are having to reach decisions on issues of fact and degree because so much of the law is constructed uh, on that way. But, but, but can't it be said that Parliament, by its latest iteration of Section 226A, has, as it were, set out the minimum obligation needed? Yes, to cover categories. But it doesn't define categories, and so one must rely upon the legislative purpose to give some content 
to the word categories in my respectful submission. And what it can't therefore mean is categories in a vacuum which are of no value to anyone. Uh, and so all, sorry to use all the cliches in the book, but all roads lead to Rome in the sense that however one analyses it, and I'll come on to try and articulate it in a second, but however one analyses it, the version 3 cannot work unless you ascribe a meaning to categories that goes beyond the, those eight or nine letters. It must mean something. And one thing we agree with, um, with my learned friend's submissions, is that the word categories in itself is a protean and unclear word, as he put it. Uh, it is, as we put it, perhaps slightly less elegantly, a fuzzy word, but both of us mean the same thing, or the consequence is the same. It has to take its meaning from the context. It doesn't have a freestanding meaning, not like um, a spanner or something. It's, it's a word, an inchoate word, if that's the right phrase, that must derive its meaning, must absorb its meaning from the context in which it's used. And in this case, as in all cases for statutory construction of protean words, the context must include consideration of the, in, of the provision in which the word is found. And I, I don't say that looked for the statutory purpose. Uh, and in each case, looked at the same statutory purpose as we say uh, is, the, uh, same, is the correct statutory purpose. And, and this morning, when my learned friend was starting his submissions, my Lord Lord Justice Davis uh, asked him whether he'd accept uh, in asking why parliaments consistently required unions to give categories and lists, that the obvious explanation is to enable the employer to make pr uh, plans and arrangements. Uh, and my learned friend accepted that it was, but he said it's an underlying rationale. It is not uh, an aid to construction of the word categories. And that's really where we part company. How can it be an underlying rationale? It's meaningless to describe it as an underlying rationale, unless it has a value in uh, informing the understanding, the content of the word uh, categories. So, except that for present purposes, that that underlying rationale would justify a purposive approach to section 226A. How far then does that one go? Well, and I'm still slightly wrestling with them, there is hardly any information which you could give where an employer would say, but even more would help us. Yes. And it's so we go on, so how far does one go? Well, the, the first qualification is it has to be information in the union's possession. Uh, and the union so. doesn't have to create it, it has no, to be there. So. Not only that, it has to be in the possession of full, of employed union officials or of the union's um, National Executive Committee or equivalent. That's a very significant reduction in the scope of the um, statutory obligation. It's got to be things that they actually, that the beating heart of the union has itself. I don't want to complicate my submissions by mixing up our submissions on the facts of this case with the point of principle. But on the facts of this case, we say that the um, fleet requirement is not complicated or esoteric or obscure requirement. It's a blindingly obvious uh, one that is needed. But in all the cases that we've had so far, the court has formed a view about whether on a particular facts the uh, categories that were used by the union does or does not pass the test. And indeed, in Several of the recent cases, like the uh, EDF and the Metroline case, it's failed the test, despite the fact that, contrary to my learned friend's submissions, we would say that our case is an A40 or our case. Our case is a clearer case uh, than those cases. But take, take um, Mr. Ford's example by reference to nurses. I mean, let's take what I hope is very much a hypothetical example of a proposed strike for nurses at a very large hospital group. Uh, would the uh, union be required to designate these are ward nurses 
these are theater nurses, these are pediatric nurses, these are kind of the elderly nurses, because there'll be different level, levels of priority and urgency in terms of cover, depending on the, uh, the kinds of treatment involved. Your argument seems to seem suggest, yes, the union will have say, we have 58 theatre nurses, and we have 46 paediatric nurses, and is that the degree of specificity which is going to be required? Only if the union has that information yes, in its possession. Assuming, yes, it does. So but assuming, if, assuming, assuming it does, then, then yes. yes. And in my right. submission, what, uh, I ask rhetorically what is wrong with that. If you have a strike that might close down a neonatal care unit, uh, you need to know that as soon as possible so you can make uh, appropriate contingency plans. Right, yep. But coming back, if I may, to my, my submission on, on the uh, content of the word categories, uh, if you treat the underlying purpose of the statute as irrelevant to construction of the word, you are necessarily assuming that the word is a clear, hard-edged term that is capable of only one meaning, like like stupid example of span. The category is just isn't that type of word. Where you have a protean word, the only way to give it meaning is to look at the legislative purpose. Uh, and as I've submitted a moment ago, uh, you can't get around that in my submission by saying underlying rationale is one thing, but you can have a rationale that doesn't amount to the legislative purpose. It's legislative purpose in this context means a purpose that uh, applies or, or that results in a purposive approach. Uh, and my learned friend said that the purpose of version 3, the legislative change represented by version 3, is to remove uncertainty. And we agreed that it was to limit uncertainty. You can't remove uncertainty because even if you have his reasonable margin of error approach, you've still got marginal cases. You've still got difficult binary choices to make about whether there's a breach or whether there hasn't been. There's wherever something is a matter of fact and degree. And I think ultimately my learned friend accepts that this is a fact and degree test. There have to be hard cases. There have to be uncertainties. The only difference between their test and ours is that you might potentially uh, draw the lines in a different place. But, and I do stress, and I'm not going to try and repeat submissions I've made uh, extensively this morning, but what we say the version 3 change doesn't mean and can't mean is that the obligation is denuded of any content so that provided the union says that there's some category, they have complied with their statutory obligation. But that's the only logical consequence uh, of the position that there is no legislative purpose. And so when you undertake the assessment of fact and degree, you are assisted and guided by the legislative purpose. And as regards my learning friend's interorum argument that will be in court all the time because unions will constantly be second-guessing uh, what would be useful for employers to know and what would not. I, I've addressed this briefly uh, already. Uh, but it is uh, limited enormously or potentially by the need for the information to be in possession of the, of the central part, the governing body or the employees of the union. Uh, but also... Uh, it's a question of fact and degree in every case, and in most cases, as in this one, we say, it's obvious, it will be obvious, what the appropriate categories should be. And may I just very, very briefly explain why, why our waterside argument below didn't uh, run counter to our submissions today. And, and in order to do so, can I just show you the... Um, Notice we haven't, as my lord said this morning, we haven't yet looked at it, but in volume one, tab five, page one two one, we have the notice itself that this litigation is about. If you turn first to page one two two. You'll see the workplaces. 
Uh, quite a few at Gatwick, a huge number at Heathrow, and 15 at Waterside. Waterside is the office complex. If you then turn back to 121, you will see that the categories of employees concerned and numbers in each category uh, include a category of one at the bottom of the page, Director of Safety and Security. That's the union's idea to have a category of one, not our own idea. What was behind uh, the Waterside argument was not none of these highfalutin points of principle, but simply this, that uh, we said it didn't make any sense that, that on their own figures there should be 14 other people at Waterside, because the Director of Safety and Security is at Waterside, so that leaves 14 others. 14 others at Waterside who fit the categories of captain, training captain, etc., etc., uh, because everybody at Waterside, we said, was a, whether they were... Uh, by profession a pilot, was not functioning as a pilot at the relevant time. And then it got a little bit com complicated on the evidence because the union said they didn't know who exactly was there and who wasn't. And uh, there was evidence that those who don't work as pilots but are pilots fly from time to time to keep their flying hours up. So we've not pursued the waterside point. But it's actually a completely different point and it's not an illustration, therefore, of the thin end of the wedge if we're right uh, on our uh, current arguments. Uh, my learned friend took the court to the consultation documents. Uh, and can I just touch on those very briefly? Again, there, it's in tab 15. And the first one is at page 19. said that unions also noted that the current law 
especially the requirement to supply such information as to enable the employer to make plans, produced a potentially open-ended requirement on them, which created great uncertainty. Well, the words open-ended, again, uh, in our submission, shows that this is directed at the mischief that we've identified from version 2, which is that you didn't know when you would have to stop what other pieces of information that you need to provide. And then in, in the government's um, response at page 24, paragraph 326, uh, second line, it says that both notices, that's 2260 and 2340, serve useful purpose. Well, exactly with respect to said. However, the government considers that the existing law uh, in, is seriously deficient insofar as it places unrealistic and unclear obligations on unions. The law should therefore be amended by clearly defining what information the union needs to provide. So again, that's wholly consistent, we respectfully submit, with our own uh, interpretation placed on the reason uh, for the changes, uh, which is uh, that it did reduce the uncertainty because you knew if you gave overall numbers, you gave categories, you gave workplaces and the numbers in the categories and workplaces, nobody could turn around and say there's a different type of information uh, that you should have been given, given even though under version 2, that argument that could have been made. The problem in the London Underground case, or the London Underground case identified, was this very problem that there was other classes of information that you might be expected to come up with. Uh, on the facts, London Underground was plainly correctly decided because all the union had done was said all employees, all categories, which nobody, I think, would nowadays uh, contend was sufficient to satisfy the statutory uh, requirement. The Serco case in our respectful submission is, on the authorities, the best point for us because in the Serco case, uh, the Court of Appeal analyzes the legislative purpose, finds it to be now the same as it's always been, they refer to it as the current rationale, uh, and they then apply it, particularly it's Paris 71 and 89 of the judgment. And all that last passage in Serco is about, that Mrs Justice Elizabeth Lang relied upon, is a frankly uh, over-ambitious argument on the part of the employer that unless you used exactly the same 50 categories as were <coughs> used on a spreadsheet that was um, employed for pay negotiation purposes, you would be in breach of your statutory obligation. Uh, we would respect say that, that plainly the Court of Appeal was right to say that was the wrong approach, but it's nowhere near uh, our own approach. Finally, uh, we respectfully submit that if we're right on the un statutory purpose or legislative purpose point, then it must follow in light of the findings made by Mrs Justice Lang that um, the injunction should be granted. It's not right, with great respect, for my learned friend to say that the degree of specificity that we are seeking in the present case is unprecedented. All we are doing is asking for the categories to reflect the categorisation of workers that operationally uh, is used at BA, as everybody knows, and is reflected in the appointment email letter, and is reflected in the union's own records, and is re reflected uh, in the business's uh, manner of operating. Uh, it's not because purely because it's called a department uh, in, the, um, in the corporate telephone directory. It's because in the real world, this is the way the business is operated. Uh, and in our respectful submission, it's plain that in her own judgment, Mrs Justice Elizabeth Lang did not go on to say that even if she was wrong on the point of law we spent so much time on, um, that nonetheless she would still have granted the injunction. It's plain that the reason, uh, sorry, that she would still have declined to grant the injunction. It's plain that the reason she declined to do so was because of... Uh, her view as to the absence of a legislative purpose. If there is a legislative purpose, as we've submitted, 
we say it's plain uh, that the um, injunction should well, be called. Well, if Mrs Justice Lang was wrong in her interpretation, that wholly opens up the overall discussion she had as to whether or not to grant it that wholly opens it up. Quite so. Uh, quite so. I, I, I simply was, uh, in, in case the court was left with the impression, which I'm sure you weren't, that she had applied her mind to that alternative scenario. She just hasn't expressed any view on that point. Either it's, way. Either way. No, no, no but uh, you? your point is her conclusion was, was vitiated by her erroneous approach in law. So, so we, we, say, we say both sides' argument really stands or falls on the legislative purpose argument. That my last minute, may I just turn my back for a second? Uh, unless I can assist the court further. Apologies for taking so much time. Mr. Ford, thank you both very much indeed for your excellent submissions on both sides. Um, we understand the urgency of this matter. At the same time, we do want to have some opportunity to reflect on what's been said to us. Uh, so what we propose to do is we will announce our decision, and we hope also we'll give our decisions at 10.30 tomorrow morning. Uh, would that be acceptable to, to both, 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 both sides? And I thank all the legal teams involved for their very helpful preparation of the case. So at 10.30 tomorrow. All right.